All right, everybody. So we are at 11 a.m. Eastern. So uh, we'll get this thing started. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to be here this morning. We really appreciate um, everyone's time and attendance here. Uh, before we turn the reins over, though, we'll do some really quick housekeeping slides. So a quick introduction of myself. I'm Patrick Anderson. I'll be here, your host uh, this morning. Um, I work with Rainbow Scientific. I'm an arborologist living here in the southeastern US. Um, Allison Harrell will also be here with us. She'll be behind the scenes making sure questions are answered and uh, chats addressed, things of that nature. She's an arborologist as well with Rainbow Scientific, and she's out uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so real quick today, quick housekeeping stuff. So if you have questions, we encourage questions during the webinar, please put them in the question and answer box and not in the chat. If you want to chat within the chat, that's fine. But if you want one of your questions answered, please put it in the question and answer box. That makes our life a lot easier uh, towards the end of the presentation so that we can get to these questions. Um, the webinar is being recorded and the link will be sent out after the webinar. So if you miss anything, you can rewatch it at your convenience. This webinar is worth one ISA CEU. And so if we did not capture your ISA CEU information when you registered, put that into the question and answer um, right now. So again, if you want your CEU for ISA and you did not put that into your registration form at the time of registration, put that into the question and answer, not in the chat. Stuff gets lost in the chat, we'll be able to find it in the question and answer. Um, this is worth one um, South Carolina pesticide applicator credit in category three. Um, at the end of the webinar, there will be a link that is provided. Uh, we still might be able to get pesticide applicator credits for a few other states. So at the end of the webinar, we'll put that link into the chat, um, put your information in there. And if we're able to get your credits, we're going to try our best to get you guys some credits. Um, so with that being said, we're going to turn it over to our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Steve Frank, who is professor of ecology and IPM in urban landscapes, nurseries, and greenhouses at the University of North Carolina. And I have just a few more things to say about Steve here. Um, he can does research and extension with the goal of increasing IPM efficiency and adaptation in ornamental landscapes, nurseries, and greenhouses. Um, his lab focuses on the ecology of plants, pests, and natural enemies and their effects uh, of climate and other urban conditions on these. Um, Steve has been a, uh, Dr. Frank has been a phenomenal collaborator with Rainbow here over the past few years. Uh, so I'm really excited to have him speak for us. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge. And with that, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing, um, give the control over to Steve and, um, and I'll be quiet and I'll let him take it away. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Frank. Thanks everybody for uh, in attendance. Sure thing, let's see. All right, good to go. All right, well, thanks everybody. Um, I'll, I'll just make one correction. I'm at North Carolina State University, um, not the other one. Um, and it sounds like you guys are getting a boatload of scale information uh, today. And so um, that's great. It's a, it's a huge topic. I'll just touch on uh, some of the points that, that, that we deal with in my lab and that I, I feel like will give you some, some background and, um, and we'll take it from there. <clears throat> One of the first things that I think is critical when working with scale insects is to be able to identify uh, different, the, the two main groups of scales, which is armored scales versus soft scales. Um, and, you know, there's thousands of scale species and, uh, you're never going to know all of them. I don't know all of them. Um, and so if you can distinguish between these two main groups of scales, then you'll be able to, you'll be one step closer to selecting the correct management uh, solutions. So armored scales, <coughs> pardon me, armored scales, there's two ways to tell the difference. Uh, in the picture here, I guess you guys can see my, my arrow. Um, if you try to remove the scale cover, okay, so scales are just flat legless insects. You can see this is a gloomy scale in the picture. It's just a pink blob. <coughs> 
And then the waxy scale cover has been removed and is laying upside down here. And so with armored scales, the scale cover called the test is not attached to the scale body, which means if you remove that cover, the insect remains on the branch and the scale cover um, you know, flitters away in the wind or, or whatever. In soft scales, the, the, the waxy part, as you, you can see this uh, wax scale here, the waxy part is attached permanently to the scale body. And so if you, if you see a scale and try and remove the cover and um, the whole insect and the cover come off as one piece, then that indicates that it's it's one of the soft scales. Okay, and the, the, the main family of soft, soft scales is coccidae, um, but there's many, many others that are, many other families that are similar. Okay, the other way is that armored scales do not produce honeydew. And so honeydew, I'm sure you're aware is the sticky solution that phloem feeding insects produce um, because phloem is primarily sugar. And so as they drink that uh, sugary solution, they have to excrete lots of sugar uh, in order to extract the nutrients. So soft scales, which are more closely related to mealybugs and aphids and white flies um, are phloem feeders and they produce that sticky honeydew that you'll find on leaves and sidewalks and cars uh, and things like that. Armored scales feed in uh, parenchyma cells, not in the phloem, and so they do not produce honeydew. And so you can kind of use those two factors as indications of, of which type of scale insect you have. Okay, we're gonna focus on armored scales uh, for this presentation. That's, uh, we do a lot of work on armored scales and soft scales in my lab. Uh, but we're going to focus on this for today. Uh, the armored scales have a lot of similarities uh, as a group. Um, typically, the eggs are laid beneath the cover, um, the female cover, of course. And so uh, they either lay eggs underneath of that cover or, in the case of gloomy scale, they give birth to live young. Um, and then the crawlers emerge from underneath of the cover uh, to find a feeding site. And the reason they're called crawlers is because they crawl. And for armored scales, that's the only mobile stage that there is. And so the crawlers have little tiny legs, they crawl around or they get blown around in wind. They find a spot um, on the plant to insert their mouth parts. And then they never move again. They start building their waxy cover uh, and and remain there. And that's common for, that's typical of, of armored scale insects. And so you can see how tiny, this is a euonymus leaf uh, that just had a, a hatch, um, a hatching event of euonymus scale and all those tiny yellow flecks are uh, euonymus scale crawlers on that leaf. Okay, so the crawlers, once they settle, uh, we call it settling when they find a spot on the plant and insert their mouth parts and begin to feed. And then they, they molt into second instars and begin building their test. Okay, the, the second instar continues building their, their test or their waxy cover. Um, and then they molt to adult and enlarge that cover. And so on this gloomy scale, uh, you'll notice these, these small white rings. Um, those are the, the first test that the second instar scales produce. And then once they molt into adults like this, they produce these larger uh, uh, convex tests. And so that, that, that initial test is always uh, maintained as part of the, the, the new test. Okay, then the adult female lays eggs under the cover and dies. Uh, and, and that's kind of the, the sad life of scales. So 
there's lots and lots of, of common scales on urban trees that you need to deal with, some native, some exotic. Um, and again, you know, learning to identify all of these is, is, is a task we can't possibly complete uh, in 45 minutes. And so I'm gonna give you some examples of very common ones that you may encounter. And then um, again, if you can tell the difference between armored and soft scales, that'll get you on your way towards management solutions. Okay, so we'll talk about gloomy scales in this picture, obscure scales, pine needle scales, and Japanese maple scales. Okay, um, I start with this picture oftentimes. This is uh, Dr. Zeno Metcalf. He was the head of entomology um, at NC State 100 years ago. And he was the last person uh, before my lab to study gloomy scales. Okay, here's a, a picture of gloomy scales, highly convex, <clears throat> excuse me. Highly convex test, okay. And in 1912, uh, Dr. Metcalf wrote a paper where he called gloomy scales um, the most important insect pest of shade trees in North Carolina. Um, and, and so of course, uh, nobody studied it again until we got here and, and uh, I noticed all of these scales. I'm not from North Carolina, I'm from Maryland uh, where gloomy scale is not common um, or wasn't common 20 years ago. And, uh, and I noticed all of these scales and, and started to, to get interested in them. So gloomy scale biology they overwinter, so right now, uh, the gloomy scales are mated adult females, okay? And so they're on the branch, they look like this, underneath they look like this, and they're just waiting um, to lay their eggs in summer, okay? Uh, so they start producing crawlers in, in mid-May, uh, sort of peak in June and July, there's one generation per year of gloomy scales, okay? Again, very convex, brownish, grayish, pretty much the color of bark. And, and their color can change depending on the shade of the bark. Okay, the primary hosts of gloomy scales are red maples, uh, partly because they seem to be the preferred host and partly because red maples are among the most commonly planted trees. And so that's where we find them. Uh, the gloomy scales will infest other trees, including hickory and ash and other maple species, of course, uh, tulip poplar and some others, but red maple um, is really the, the, the primary problem. Again, both for its, its pr uh, preferred by the scales and also because red maples are so common. Okay, the damage of gloomy scales and of, of scales in general have um, similar symptoms. And you can look at these red maples, these are on NC State campus. Um, and because the scales become so dense and they, they densely cover the twigs and the trunk uh, and branches of these trees, they're pulling out nutrients that otherwise the tree would use for, um, for growth. And so what you end up with is a lot of, uh, you start with some small dead branches, the ends of the twigs may die as the nutrients, you know, there's not enough nutrients reaching the ends to uh, elongate those and, and produce leaves. And then gradually the canopy will get thinner to where you know, on, on this tree, you can see that building behind it right through through the canopy, which is, is not preferred. Uh, you know, gradually you get larger branch dieback, which can lead to misshapen trees like this one on the left um, and potentially death. Oops. Okay, next is, um, obscure scale. Now obscure scale is actually 
related to gloomy scale. They're in the same genus. Um, you might say they look similar, but most people would say that all scales look similar. And so um, that's not really uh, very useful, but it's, it's round, you know, to generally round, uh, but much flatter than gloomy scales. Okay, so not as convex um, and a little darker in color. Okay, so here's a picture of some obscure scale, uh, probably on a pin oak, it looks like. Um, biology, again, very similar to the gloomy scale um, and the typical armored scale biology, one generation per year. In this case, the obscure scales overwinter as nymphs. Uh, most of the time, they mature in late spring and crawlers are active for most of the summer. And so in this, in this picture, um, the adult females, you know, they've, they've really shriveled up here as they've um, dedicated all their motherly resources to producing um, these eggs and crawlers underneath. Okay, so, so they produce the young and then, and then shrivel and die. And the reason, I'll go back for one second, the, the reason that it's important when these nymphs are active, we'll get to uh, because of the management requirements for scales. The, um, the crawlers are the most, as you can probably imagine, crawlers are the most sensitive to insecticides um, and crawlers are not underneath of a waterproof cover. And so they're most susceptible for that reason in addition to being smaller. Um, and so it's important to know when the, when the crawlers are active uh, to target your management, but we'll talk more about that. Okay, obscure scale hosts. Oaks are the primary host of this insect. Uh, it seems pin oaks are, are especially susceptible in other uh, red oak species, uh, but it, we do find it on, on lots of white oaks and uh, willow oaks and others. And we've seen it on maples and dogwoods and hickories and things also. So, so it is pretty generalist, but oaks seem to be the preferred um, genus. Okay, pine needle scales. Pine needle scales are part of um, one of the, the, the two sort of broad categories of scales where the gloomy scales and obscure scales were round and sort of globular. Many of the armored scales fall into this, this group that are oblong or oyster shell shaped. Okay, so the pine needle scale is one of those. Obviously, uh, this is an adult. This yellow part is the um, the molted exoskeleton um, or the molted test of the, the second instar. And so that's retained. And then the adult builds this larger, larger test to live under. Okay. Uh, you can see how densely these scales can colonize pine needles. Okay, the, the pine needle scale is, is uh, kind of varied in its life cycle, depending a lot on location. And this is true of all insects and, and all scale insects. But in uh, the mid-Atlantic and New England, you're gonna have one generation per year of this. Uh, in, in warmer areas in the South, you could have two or, or potentially more, you know, two and a half generations or something like that. And so, um, sorry, I'm running a homeschool here as well. So, um, so pine needle scales, they can have multiple generations per year. This is what the eggs and crawlers look like in the bottom picture. Okay, hosts, almost all pine species um, and, and, and not just pines, but firs and spruces and cedars also are susceptible. 
All right, Japanese maple scale is is a big one that that you probably have encountered. Um, it's it's an exotic scale. You can probably tell by the name. The name is misleading in, in multiple ways, though, because um, it the the scale does not only feed on Japanese maples and it does not only feed on maples. And so it's not just a maple scale from Japan, and it's not a scale that just feeds on Japanese maples. Um, and so often, because of the the poor common name, people may not look or suspect of this. And I've had I've had nursery growers when I give a presentation like this say, "Well, I don't have that because I don't grow Japanese maples." But this scale is among the most generous, the the most generalist scales uh, that I know of. It will feed on um, hundreds of plant species, and it 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 uh, its generations are much shorter and it can become very dense very quickly. This is a dogwood uh, near the kids' school. And you can see how densely it's covered with these white flecks. Okay, here's a, a maple branch that's that's got Japanese maple scales on it. And with Japanese maple scales, I'll have another picture, but they're they're really kind of a brown color but the test is covered with a powdery uh, white wax. And so they look white, but if you, if you rub those scales just gently with your finger, um, you'll see that they're brown underneath. Okay, so way north, they have one generation per year. In the mid-Atlantic, they have at least two and um, you know, and these things are 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 changing uh, because of the way that um, the climate is warming, and also because of urbanization. And so, I think in the Mid Atlantic, they probably have more generations at this point than they did when there was a lot of research on this this scale uh, ten or twenty years ago. Okay, so in the same way that. Uh, when I was a kid in Maryland, we couldn't grow crepe myrtles, even though we wanted to, um, because it was too cold. And I'm not that old. Uh, now, you know, people grow crepe myrtles all over the place in Maryland. It's not a big deal at all. Uh, so the same thing for scales. You can get more generations and more species of scales as they spread due to the changing climate. Okay, in, in the southeast, we have at least three generations per year of this insect. Um, it overwinters in the mid-Atlantic and northern states in immature stages. Uh, I've seen it here during the winter in every stage, you know, and I, I've even seen it, you know, be relatively active as far as producing eggs and um, um, and populations de developing in the winter because we get so many warm days in a row, it can sort of move in and out of, of development depending on the weather. Okay, so this, this gets to where the crawler stage is important in terms of management and gets really tricky because this, this scale and others have multiple overlapping generations. And what that means is that for the whole season, for the whole year, you have adults and uh, juvenile nymphs and crawlers and eggs all at the same time. And so, you know, the Euonymus scale that we showed in one of the first slides, in the spring, they tend to hatch kind of all at one time. And on any given bush, it seems like euonymus scales hatch, you know, within a week of each other or even within days of each other. And so it's easy with a scale like that to target that crawler stage. And essentially, you know, if you've got, if you've got millions of crawlers all at the same time, you can practically just hose them off because they're so little and weak. Um, when you have a scale like this Japanese maple scale, 
you know, the crawlers are the susceptible stage, uh, but you have, but you can't target them all at one time the way that we would like to. And so that's why this scale and, and some of the others with multiple generations are so difficult to manage um, uh, because you can't get that clean, that clean kill uh, of all the crawlers at once. Okay, Japanese maple scales have a very wide host range, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, if you just walk around and you got you guys are in trees all the time, um, maples, service berry, camellia. Uh, I see a lot on red buds, a lot on elms. All the new elms that are being planted are often covered with. Japanese maple scales, um, tilia, uh, lots of lots of different species, and so so almost any tree, you know, could be suspect of having this particular scale species. Okay, as I mentioned in the beginning, there's obviously thousands of scale species and. Uh, we can't cover all of them. And, and even if I did, you know, the, the amount that um, you'd remember about each particular species uh, would probably be minimal. So, you know, this is a great book uh, by uh, Doug Miller and, and John Davidson that outlines the armored scale pests of trees and shrubs. And there's other resources available also. Um, but there's, there's armored scales on every plant species. And so they're always a possibility. In terms of management, we discussed already that the timing of control is critical. And the timing issue was even more important um, you know, 20 years ago before we had much in the way of systemic insecticides. Uh, you know, with the systemic insecticides, we can make the plant toxic to feed on rather than having to um, actually contact the insect with insecticides, which helps with the management. Um, but it still is best to target those early stages and those crawlers uh, because they are more susceptible uh, even to systemics. <clears throat> so, um, you know, some of the, the older products that are available, um, pyrethroids and carbaryl and, and asphate and, and worse, when those are applied uh, to the, the foliage of trees, where the trunks, um, the trunks and foliage of trees, uh, they have contact efficacy, which means they have to contact the, the body, the flesh of the insect, or they have to be eaten by the insect. And so for things like free living insects, like caterpillars, um, it's possible, uh, even though, even though these aren't the best necessarily products for caterpillars either, Caterpillars move around, they eat leaves. They're not covered in a waterproof uh, shell. And so you're much more likely to make contact um, with that insect or have it eat the residue than scale insects that don't move. And so if you don't contact the scale insect, um, it's not going to crawl across that residue because they don't move. And they're also waterproof. And so what, what's been shown time and time again, um, and we're seeing kind of a resurgence of this now, is that pyrethroids and these contact insecticides uh, actually make scale infestations worse because the, the product does not kill the scales that are underneath of the waterproof covers, but instead it leaves a residue that kills parasitoids and predators that specialize on killing scales. And so after, after multiple years of 
these residual products, you can get more scales than if you hadn't used them at all. And the reason that we're getting a resurgence in this kind of activity now is um, we've noticed a lot with mosquito sprays. And so, uh, you know, as, as yards get these routine pyrethroid, uh, they're typically bifenthrin applications. Um, the, uh, we do see scale populations develop in those properties. Okay, so other products besides those, um, those more toxic products, horticultural oil, you can use um, when crawlers are present or in the winter, apply a heavier uh, formulation um, to try and kill those overwintering ones. Uh, there's also some newer emulsified oils that mix easier. Uh, Stuff Oil X from BioWorks is one. Uh, they stay in solution. Uh, you know, when you open the jar, they kind of look like mayonnaise rather than a liquid, but because they're emulsified, they stay in solution a little better. They don't leave a toxic residue, so you're not endangering the natural enemies and other non-target organisms. Um, but they do, you know, they do require repeat applications to make a dent in those populations, especially if you have multiple generations per year. Okay, so so other other solutions um, include neonicotinoids, and so these are active ingredients: dinotefuran acetamiprid, thiamethoxam, and aminocloprid is a, is a neonicotinoid also. The first three, dinotefuran, acetamiprid, and thiamethoxam, um, are effective for armored scale management. Aminocloprid is, is typically not effective for armored scale management. Um, the real reasons behind this aren't, aren't well studied. Uh, but aminocloprid is the least soluble of these products. And so as, as uh, the product moves through the vascular system of the tree, um, aminocloprid moves slower and it probably is less likely to cross membranes into the areas where these cells are feeding. But in any case, uh, with aminocloprid applications, you can get also greater scale abundance than if you hadn't made those applications. And uh, part of this is because um, sometimes insects exposed to aminocloprid and spider mites will produce um, more eggs after that exposure. And, and also the scales become toxic for natural enemies to feed on. Another solution, you know, uh, the neonicotinoids are, are falling out of favor for some uses and uh, the, you know, and, and some public perception problems that they have in terms of harm to pollinators. Um, and so insect growth regulators are another great choice and in some cases uh, seem to work better. And so, you know, pyroproxifen and buprofacin are insect growth regulators that have uh, worked very well on armored scales um, and are have become the recommended management for Japanese maple scales in, in nurseries where they've been tested uh, instead of the neonicotinoids. So you have these two groups to work with. Uh, the, the other thing to think about in terms of armored scale management, and this is what we think a lot about in the lab, is what causes scale infestations to begin with. Um, you know, if you go out in, in the woods hiking, uh, you don't find trees that are just covered head to toe in, in scale insects, but when, you've, when you look at urban trees, they are. And, you know, to sort of condense years of research, the the, the primary indicator of this is the amount of impervious surface cover around a tree. And we've studied this with gloomy scale and other species. Um, but impervious surface cover like roads and sidewalks and rooftops and, and what have you, 
they do a couple of things that benefit scale insects. They increase the temperature, the ambient air temperature um, around the tree. They reduce water infiltration and soil moisture. So the trees are under stress uh, because they don't have enough water. Um, and so that increases, you know, uh, causes a, a sort of drought stress within the tree. And so if, you know, if we just graph the relationship between the amount of impervious surface on this X axis around a tree and the abundance of gloomy scales, there's a pretty uh, strong linear relationship. More impervious surface equals more gloomy scales. So can we use this relationship between impervious surface and gloomy scales to improve IPM and tree health? Uh, we know a basic tenet of um, our borer culture and IPM is to put the right plant in the right place and to, to ensure longevity and growth. And we know that impervious surface cover is bad for trees and, and good for gloomy scales. So we set out to find how much is too much. Okay. Uh, with red maples, you've got them growing in all manner of environments. Here's a nice lush uh, yard, a tree in a, in a fairly large uh, median here, smaller median, and then this unfortunate critter stuck in um, kind of a, a four by four square. So what we found, we, we've We've investigated hundreds of trees in, in lots of southeastern and mid-Atlantic states. And the general rule here is, is there's a threshold of where to plant red maples and where not to plant red maples. And this threshold you can also use if you're managing red maples to know which ones are at most risk of scale infestation and may need greater attention from you. And so if a tree at uh, 20 or 25 yards around the tree is surrounded by zero to 32% impervious surface, most likely that tree will remain in good or excellent condition with minimal scale infestation. In the middle, 33 to 66% impervious surface, you're most likely to end up with a, a tree that's in good or fair condition. Okay, so not as great as as less impervious surface, uh, but they can do okay. They may need extra, extra water, extra love, uh, extra monitoring for those trees. So not ideal, um, but much better of course, than this tree on the right that uh, is the tree you're guaranteed to get if you put a red maple in an area over 66% impervious surface. It's almost, guaranteed to have that poor condition. So how do you measure impervious surface? Uh, it's great to have these thresholds, but if, if we can't apply them, uh, it's not very useful. So, so of course there's, there's multiple ways to do this. Um, you know, in the lab, we use uh, some GIS uh, tools to measure impervious surface at a landscape scale. And so using ArcGIS or um, other programs, you know, we can fill in this impervious surface automatically. And if you were going to plant a tree right here, uh, this calculation would show that you're at 66% impervious surface, not a great place for a red maple tree. Um, or many other trees in that situation. So, so if the, the folks who are designing landscapes, um, landscape architects and, and designers and planners typically have this sort of software and they could implement these thresholds at the planning stage. But what if you don't have that software either because um, you know, you just don't, you're not, uh, you know, you, you just don't, it's expensive and it's hard to use. Uh, 
um, or you know you're out in the field and don't have access to it even if you even if you did know how to use it um, so what what could you do then to tackle this question in the lab we asked if there was a way to measure impervious surface cover without software so that people could do it in the field um, in a sort of analog way all right and it turns out that there is and we call this the paste to plant method and the the summary here um, is that you really are just you're counting steps and the number of steps that land on impervious surface using um, a specific protocol here. So let's go through this. Here's that same tree we looked at before, same planting site. And what you would do at that planting site is find the closest impervious edge, which is this curb right here, and turn 45 degrees from that edge and take 25 steps. So that, um, well, those steps went backwards for some reason, but anyways, you would start at the tree and you would take 25 steps um, out from the tree, okay? And you would count each time that your foot lands on impervious surface indicated by these white footsteps, okay? You come back to the tree, you turn 90 degrees and repeat that procedure. Again, you would, I don't know why today these are going backwards, but you would start at the tree, walk out this direction and count the number of steps on impervious surface. Turn 90 degrees again and repeat that. Okay, try not to step on cars uh, and things like that. Be careful when you're crossing streets and you would just repeat this four times. So having repeated it four times, you've taken 100 steps. Hopefully you've kept track of the number of steps that, that have, have been on impervious surface. And if you do this, uh, you get the same um, percent impervious surface as if you had used the GIS software. Okay, 66 steps equals 66%. Okay, no red maple for you. And, you know, it doesn't matter if, uh, you know, we tried this with my shortest student and my tallest student. Uh, this is Adam Dale who, who developed this with me. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if, if you take a, you know, if your radius is a little bit larger or a little bit smaller. Um, we've tested this with every conceivable landscape configuration um, and, and it still works if you follow that procedure. Okay, so again, you find the closest impervious edge and turn 45 degrees to make your first transect come back um, 90 degrees from that first one. Um, and again, and again, and just count them up. Okay, so then you remember your steps, you apply these, this simple threshold of essentially, you know, um, dividing it into thirds of, of zero to 33, 33 to 66 and 67 to 100 to make a decision about whether to plant a red maple there or to make a decision about um, how, how much at risk that tree is based on its planting site. Okay, so we talked about the difference between armored versus soft scale. And again, this is important because imidacloprid is, is not recommended for armored scale management and so uh, Aminocloprid is, is now the most widely used insecticide in the world. We apply it to trees and crops and grass and dogs and cats and cows and pigs and, um, you know, house foundations. Uh, it, it's, it's just the most applied insecticide in the world at this point, um, but not for armored scales. And so that's why it's important to distinguish these two groups.
Uh, briefly, just a look at soft scales. I'm sure you'll get some more as the, as the day goes on. Um, but the soft scales, eggs are often laid in late spring or early summer. Underneath this wax scale, there's tons of crawlers emerging. Um, crawlers emerging, these, these yellow flecks from this oak lacanium scale. Here's a close up of some crawlers there. Okay, and the, the soft scales often have a different life cycle from armored scales in that they may move two or more times during their life. And so oftentimes what happens is the eggs hatch, uh, the insects overwinter on twigs, the eggs hatch and then feed on the leaves for the summer and then move back to the twigs. So that was their second movement um, in the fall before the leaves fall off. Okay, so one scale that we've studied quite a bit in the lab and that I'm sure you encounter on a daily basis is oak lacanium scale. Um, it's, it's brownish to red. The egg cases are these big convex um, covers. Uh, these are the adult females and these are the nymphs that feed on the leaves. They're very small and translucent. Okay, so, so right now, you know, we've got these overwintering stages, um, uh, late in star nymphs that will develop in the spring, produce eggs in early summer. There's 2,000 or 3,000 eggs in each one of these ovisacs, and the crawlers feed on the leaves in spring and summer. Okay, the hosts here. Uh, oak, hickory, sycamore, birch, and there's a related scale called European fruit lacanium, which is almost indistinguishable and feeds on a much wider variety of hosts, but the, the management and identification is essentially the same. And so that one's common on red buds and dog buds. And um, again, the elms that everybody is planting these days seem susceptible to, to almost everything. Okay, and the same kind of damage that we see, canopy thinning, leaf drop, branch dieback, but with soft scales, you have the added um, harm or, or uh, you know, potential complaint by clients of having honeydew all over the place. And so that's usually what people notice before they actually see the scale insects is that their, their car is sticky or their deck is sticky or their grill is sticky. Um, and so you'll, you'll notice that. Okay, and importantly, from work that we've done in the lab, um, these lacanium scales and other species respond just like the gloomy scales to higher temperatures. And so when we go out in Raleigh and find, um, you know, relatively cool trees and trees that are two to three degrees hotter in these red bars, we have 10 to 12 times more lacanium scales on those trees that are in hotter locations caused by the amount of impervious surface that surrounds those trees. Okay, so again, the planting considerations are important um, to reduce susceptibility to lots of scales, not just the gloomy scales. Okay. Um, again, lots and lots of soft scales to deal with. Calico scale is a big one, magnolia scale. Uh, tulip tree scale seems to be an increasing problem. Um, cottony maple scales and all these different ones. Um, but start with just distinguishing armored versus soft. Okay, if you want more information about the work that we do, uh, if you want to geek out on our research and, and scientific publications, or if you want to find extension materials related to the paste plant technique or other things that we've done, uh, you can visit our website. It's very easy, ecoipm.org. Okay, you can find management guides on there under the extension tab uh, for implementing the paste to plant system. 
uh, we pest, you know, there's there's iBooks on there that we've created. These are especially good IPM for select deciduous trees in nursery production, uh, but the same things apply to uh, landscape trees. And so these books are free. They cover insects, diseases, and horticultural practices. Um, we, we write a lot of articles in the lab for industry publications, and, and those are all posted as well. All right, folks, that's what I've got for you um, today. So I think I stopped sharing now. Is that correct, Patrick? That's right. And then I'll see if I can uh, pull the screen back. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, Dr. Yeah, sure. It's always a pleasure. Um, Real quick, just want to kind of for everybody, you know, go over just a little bit more in the, the management of these scales. You know, the one thing that we focus on is, of course, the scale toolbox. And Dr. Frank alluded to this, um, you know, where you have some products that are foliar sprays, but then we have our systemic products that can be applied in some cases via a lower systemic bark spray through direct tree injection or through soil application. And so when we talk about the management toolbox, it's always important to note, you know, of course, the species of the pest, um, you know, whether it be an armored or soft scale. Um, and then, of course, the site and then what's important to your client. And these are always things to keep in mind. Um, and with scale specifically, Dr. Frank covered this, you know, we're targeting this crawler phase. And of course, this is a very generalized life cycle of a scale insect, but targeting that crawler phase and making sure whether that systemic or that foliar applied product is applied to target that phase. Um, some things that uh, Dr. Frank had mentioned, uh, insect growth regulators, and, and Dr. Frank mentioned how in some cases these might work um, you know, better in some cases, depending upon the scale and of course the, the timing of the life cycle. And so we this year are really excited at Rainbow to bring out a product called Proxite, which the active ingredient is pyroproxifen, as was mentioned. And so this can be applied um, as crawlers are emerging and will have, in some cases, a 28-day residual. It's translaminar, so it gets absorbed into green parts of the plant, like the leaves and the, the twig tissue, the green twig tissue. And then we have things like Transtec, which is dinotectoran, which can be applied as systemic. Um, that can also be applied as a direct trunk injection. Zytec, which is a metacloprid, which we talked about, is not effective on armored scales, but when timed correctly, can be effective on soft scales. And then likewise, horticultural oil as Dr. Frank had mentioned. Um, and then the difference here, of course, is the soft and the armored scales is you see the armored scales, um, as we can't emphasize enough, the imidacloprid is not going to work well on your armored scales. But again, your insect growth regulators like Proxite, uh, Transtech, whether it's applied as a soil application or lower systemic bark spray, and then direct trunk injection there um, is very, very um, beneficial and can be very beneficial. And so again, why are we talking about this? You know, if you're on the webinar last week, we talked about the fact that no matter where we are in the country, scale insects comes up some somewhere on our clients' landscapes, top five pests they're dealing with. So that's why we're spending so much time concentrating on these. And this year, we put together our scale insect management guide, which can be found um, on the Rainbow Tree Care Scientific website, as well as reaching out to your local territory manager or virologist like Allison or myself. Um, and so before we get to questions, if we have any questions in the, the chat box here, um, in a moment here, I'm going to put into the chat a link. Uh, you're going to want to click on that link to get your, this would be for your state pesticide credits. Um, we are approved for South Carolina credits. We're working on other state credits. So I will post a link. Um, it'll take you to a Google form. Just follow those instructions, fill them out um, completely, and uh, we'll do our best to make sure that you get uh, a CEU, no guarantees if you're outside of South Carolina for this presentation. Um, and as indicated here, if your uh, certification requires that you have a proof of attendance, let us know and we'll send that to you directly. Um, and with that, we'll turn to the uh, question answers for the next uh, six minutes or so. Um, Allison, I'm not sure if we have anything on there um, that's appropriate. Yeah, um, we have a question to get the website that Dr. Frank had shared. 
Okay. Um, I can post that in the chat if you want. It's uh, just ECOIPM for ecoipm.org. Cool. Thank you. Okay. And I think there may be some questions, Patrick, around the, because I think we've got some. Okay. How, how long do different adults live? Um, well, it, it, it depends on the species. You know, some species, the Japanese maple scales have, um, you know, two or three generations a year, uh, but none of the adults live after they lay eggs um, that first time. And so they're, uh, you know, typically they li live one season. Um, trying to think of how to best describe this, but but the adults live until they reproduce and then they die. And so whether that happens three times a year or one time a year, um, they, they do not live, you know, you don't get an accumulation of adults that live for multiple years and continue uh, producing young. They just, they just have one, uh, one season of reproduction. Now, sometimes that happens all at once. You know, the Lacanium scales, they produce all their eggs at once and then die. Uh, gloomy scales, they trickle out their crawlers slowly over the course of eight weeks, uh, which makes it hard. But again, once that female has exhausted her supply, she's, she's, she dies. And so she just has that one crack at it, even though it's an extended time. Great, thank you. All right, I'm just kind of squeezing through. Okay, so <laughs> Patrick, will you clarify really quickly, pesticide applicator should not be coming through the Q&A, correct? That's correct. So pesticide applicator, um, there is, so Steve, Dr. Frank just posted a link to his website, EcoIPM. Just above that, there is a link um, that says forms, in uh, in the web address there, that is where you'd want to fill out the information for your state pesticide CEU. So ISA CEUs, put that into the Q and A. Pesticide CEUs, you're going to have to click on that link that just got posted into the chat and fill out that information fully. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Frank, what is the results of pine scale? Will it be deadly to a tree? Um, well, I think if if you have if you have, uh, you know, really dense populations like we saw in one of those pictures, um, you know, trees die pretty slowly, but what's going to happen first is that tree is just going to become sort of unsightly and unhealthy. The needles can't, can't live as long when they've got scales sucking out all their juices. And so, uh, the tree is going to get kind of shabby and, um, um, and, and not have that dense of a canopy that will, will gradually uh, get worse. You know, at, at what point the tree dies, it's hard to say if it does or if it just plods along and gets sicker and sicker. Um, but, uh, but there, you know, be, before that point, people probably wish it was dead because it would just be ugly and slow growing. So. And it looks like that might be it for the questions right now, which is perfect because we're just about at time. Um, so a real quick kind of rainbow commercial. We do have a lot of webinars coming up. So of course we have three more webinars on scale today alone. We'll have another four webinars on scale on Thursday. Um, and then we have several other series uh, that talk about uh, the business of plant health care as well as series around spotted lanternfly uh, emerald ash borer, um, and various other things that we'll be posting throughout the rest of the season. Um, you'll get a survey at the end of this, so please take the time to fill up that survey. Let us know how we did. Let us know how we can improve um, any little details. And of course, um, you know, feel free to be uh, very 
very frank. Uh, <laughs> so with that, Dr. Frank, I really appreciate your time here. We really appreciate your time here. It was a great job. And um, for everybody else, we look forward to seeing you here shortly. Have a great day, everybody. We'll talk My to you pleasure. soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.